Welcome to Video Today. Video Today is part of the Utah Video series that we just restarted. <laughs> and if you saw the earlier Utah Video, wait a minute, you can't see the earlier Utah Video. We recorded it. We presented it to the computer and the computer said, I'm a PC, I'm not an iMac, I can't read this. So we lost a recording of what we had previously taught on video about returning to your first love, doing those things over again that possibly you may have neglected through time and effort, through things happening, or maybe ministry growing, or for whatever reason, God letting you have his permissive will as opposed to his perfect will. And we discussed that a little bit and we, you know, pretty much came to the conclusion that God wants us to examine ourselves, not others. And when we examine ourselves, we find whether or not we be in the faith or just talking about it. One of the things I've discovered the last few days is that I'm so much more effective when I allow the Spirit of God to lead me as He chooses as opposed to what I would discipline or structure myself to do. Now, because I'm the preacher at Video Church, I'm kind of stuck with some things that people expect. Now, I'll admit that if God says, no, I won't go do it, but we record, you know, and we are there for people that assemble together outside as being Utah's only outdoor church on Sundays and Wednesdays. But, you know, there are times where, you know, we would like to do more and God says do less. And the way he explained it was that, you know, these plants, you know, sometimes, you know, they grow oddly and, you know, they don't grow in the way that they should grow. But if we allow them to do what's natural to them and give them the right amount of water, potted the right way, and allow the husbandman, meaning our father who's in heaven, to take care of the plant, then it'll grow right. But when we don't, it'll grow kind of weird like this plant does, you know, it kind of goes all over the place. And that's caused by not watering it properly or not pruning it when it needed it, or not transplanting it when it should. And so we discussed that at Vidivo, and we'll be seeing more Utah Vidivos in the near future. They'll probably be called Utah Vidivo and UV1. But one of the things that God's impressed upon me was that there were things in my life that I didn't like. Things I didn't know quite how to stop doing or quit being a part of, except to just quit. Now some of you are probably thinking that means sin, and I'm thinking no, but just simply, you can't save the world. Maybe that's what our little thing today at Video Today is about, is you can't save the world. In other words, things are going to happen in the near future that are going to be obvious to the end of the world. Some people think they know what those sequence of events are, and some people don't, like creating the red moon, you know, fallacy, the false teaching, or creating the harbinger so that you can feel like you're a part of prophecy because some guy invented, you know, all these coincidences or coincidences that he says as a conspiracist, you know, he's a messianic conspiracist, but as he, you know, wants you to believe, oh, America's in prophecy. Well, no, it's not, but okay. But, you know, I mean, that's what his shtick is, and he sold his book, so, you know, praise the Lord. But really, as we see God reveal, obviously, his plan for the nations and his will for the last days and the end of days quickly approaching us within the next few years, then we begin to understand that you can't stop you know, you can't fight Mother Nature is what the expression is. You can't fight City Hall. Well, you can't fight God. God is going to do his thing. Prophecy will be fulfilled. You know, I 
went very much so just recently on the Israeli elections, praying for, talking about, and hoping that Bibi, Prime Minister Benjamin Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, would not get reelected because somebody in Israel is going to sell out the people of Israel by signing a peace treaty with the Antichrist, with the false Messiah. And whoever does that will be just like the scribes and the Pharisees, children of Satan. And while King Bibi was declared that a long time ago, and we pretty much at Bidibo Church and Bidibo Prophecy warned about if he continues, he will be the man of the people like Aaron was, and unfortunately he'll be more like Saul than David. And right now, people in America, especially evangelical Christians like Bibi or Benjamin Netanyahu, being the prime minister and they're willing to do things for him, but unfortunately they might be liking Saul because they want a king and they don't really appreciate the fact that Mr. Netanyahu is not a Christian. He's not really that much of an Orthodox Jew or a Jew following God. He's a politician and he's willing to do a lot of things and he's very wealthy. A lot of things to get elected and he did it and he barely survived this last re-election. So we'll see what happens in the future. I hope he's not the one, but it's beginning to look like he's the one to become the new Judas, unfortunately, to the children of Israel. Because he doesn't follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't really believe in God, but he believes in man. And that leads us to today's message and where we are, you know, when it comes to end times and looking at video light. You know, we're told that if we would walk in the light as He is in the light, we would have fellowship one with another. Well, that works and it doesn't work. You know, on the one hand, you know, there's like, I look at the church and I go, well, you know, there's there's some good things that it does, but there's a lot of junk that, you know, is growing in it that I just don't want to be a part of. You know, the 2016 elections are coming up and believe me, Calvary chapels are going to go way out of their way to promote their favorite candidate like they did previously when they were promoting um, the Mormon candidate, you know, to become president. I personally said, hey, you know, if you're going to vote, I wouldn't vote for either one. <laughs> you know, I mean, and frankly, you know, a lot of Christians didn't because unfortunately for them, you know, they would have to choose between what they didn't like in President Obama being the sitting president and being a Christian, though nominal, at some people's point of view, that being they didn't like him, they wanted to vote for someone else, anyone else, but they weren't quite sure about voting Mormon for the most powerful person in the United States you know, of America, especially when the church itself can control the people in the church by recent demonstration excommunicating people which is real obvious, and that's why, no offense, but Mormons aren't going to get elected to the president, not unless the church changes its ways. They keep excommunicating people, American people aren't going to trust them. That's just the way it works. I mean, it's kind of obvious to most of us, so sadly for Mitt Romney, I mean, he may become a vice president, but I don't think he would ever become a president. You know, that's just popularity. They like people being free to express their religious views, even if that means contradictory to the church they attend. And that brings us to each and every one of us in video life. We have to, on the one hand, look at the world at large and recognize that it's going sometimes the wrong way. But it doesn't mean that it won't, you know, change its ways or that it might, you know, have to be let go in order to let God do what he's going to accomplish in prophecy. When we do that, then we can have peace one with another. We can have that love that, hey, you know, you love your brother, but you don't go with them in their sin. You may love the way the country's going, but you don't go with them into violence. You know, you may love the fact that you can be in the military by freedom, but that may not be the perfect will for God choosing you to be his servant. If you want to serve God, a better place would be missionary field than, you know, the mission being killing people. But that's just, you know, walking in the light. It's the Bible shows us what the Word of God says about all of these things. So in 
Today we're looking at my eyes fail with looking upward. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed within me. But thou, O Lord, how long? How long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. My heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, O oh, that I had the wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. I have felt that way for the last three days, and maybe a little bit longer, slightly, but then greatly so the last three days when I spent all my days, all day long, working on the house and setting it up for spring. As we're sitting outside, it's spring here in Utah. And it's March, but it's spring. <laughs> Figure that one out. St. Patrick's Day, yesterday or today, I'm not sure which. But the point being is that the weather has changed, and you can be in denial and say there's no climate change, but God's going to fulfill his promise, which he said that the world temperature would increase. Now, how and why is just his own will and way that he chooses to do it. If you decide to deny that, you can go with Bill O'Reilly and Bill O'Reilly wants to declare a holy war, and he's lied before, and he probably will lie again, like most of us, but the facts don't change, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so if he has said that the world in the latter days would increase in temperature, then it's going to increase. Now, some people would say, well, yeah, but what about the snow? Well, that's not temperature. That's just snowfall. Sometimes it has to warm up in order to snow then it has to get colder. I know for myself, like when I lived in Alaska, sometimes it was too cold to snow. I mean, I know that you, you do understand about sleet and hail and stuff, and sometimes those happen in ice storms, but really for snowfall, it needs to be right around, you know, 32 degrees, you know, somewhere within three or four or five degrees, you know, plus or minus, depending on what kind of, you know, weather environment you're dealing with. And so, Watching the weather and recognizing the times, we look at the scriptures and we examine to see what it's like. Me sitting here in March outside when it's 20 degrees warmer than what it should be or what it normally is. And sometimes setting a hundred year mark. That kind of lets you know that things are changing. And one of the things I like about changing is that these last three days were, you know, pretty not positive. You know, we were, uh, God was talking to me last night about that while I was staying up most of the night, you know, just wrestling with a lot of things in my mind. And we have a radio station that likes to say, positive, encouraging, Caleb. Well, you know, I like positive and encouraging, but there are times I'm discouraged. I like, you know, worship in some styles, in some formats, at times, but I don't worship all the time. I'm not built that way. I don't have, you know, like four or twenty elders casting my crown down over and over again, or, you know, standing before the throne with, you know, four heads and worshiping God, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. But being who I am, there are times where I'm down, or that I'm out, or that, as David is saying, you know, that, hey, my eyes fail looking up. I've been waiting and wondering how long, how long, how long. And David was looking for deliverance, but we're looking for the return of the Lord. You know, Jesus is coming in this generation, and he's coming sooner than you think. So don't, you know, neglect the fact that that won't change anything, regardless of whether the country goes through prosperity or poverty. The changes you'll see are people getting distracted or lack of knowledge of the Word of God. I see it a lot nowadays that I used to say when I got saved 40 years ago, you know, about 41 years ago now probably, but I used to say, well, you know, how can that be true, Lord, that first of all, how could you question whether there would be faith? Of course there's faith. Look at the Jesus movement. We're all, you know, right on. We've all been studying the Bible. We all have our our hermeneutic and homiletic down. We've all learned inductive Bible studies. We'll never fall away will never be led astray. We know the Bible.
Romaine on Thursday mornings used to misquote the Bible and say, see, you don't know it as well as you think you do. Because he'd say, turn into James chapter 6. And there's only five chapters, I think. But the point being is that I thought that with knowledge increasing, we would know these things and they would be obviously true to all of us. But then I found in my latter years and in my former years, slowly there crept into the mentality of evangelicals this idea of prosperity. Not the prosperity doctrine, but just normal being wealthy. Christians are very wealthy. Most Christians I know, just like even me, I consider myself wealthy, even though I'm probably considered in the poverty level and below poverty level, but I mean, we have one income. <laughs> you figure that one out. But you know, and we rent. You know, we don't own. We don't own anything, matter of fact. But, um, and you know, I dumpster dive and I, you know, cut plants to make them grow. You know, <laughs> keep cutting them and keep planting them and you get lots of plants. You know, and people throw away things that I'll collect. You know? But even so, I know that I'm wealthy because I live in America. You know, and Americans are wealthy Christians. You know, and how hard it is for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus warned, was it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a wealthy man or rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's not just an analogy, but it's a true statement. If you look at Americans today, they think that owning guns is a right and a privilege that you should exercise. That's false. That's not even scriptural. They think that somehow Jesus telling them to buy a sword meant that you could be, you know, violent in nature or that you could be the violent man that the Bible warned he brought judgment upon the world for every thought of man was towards violence and violence filled the earth. Uh, when it fills the earth, God wipes the earth out. You may want to rethink your thinking. That's kind of why you don't want to join the military. You know, If your violent nature comes out in Abu Ghraib, you can see what the humanity of our heroes is like. Our heroes aren't some, you know, prison guards who were perverts before and then suddenly they got in the military and became perverted. No, that's human nature is perversion. It's part of being satanic or being influenced by the God of this world. If you're not being filled with the spirit of God, you're being filled with the spirit of error or the spirit of this world, the spirit of Antichrist. So you really need to choose wisely where you're investing your time and your mental capacity. Because as I looked over the years, I saw the Jesus that's being taught by even Calvary chapels isn't the Jesus I know. It isn't at all. Matter of fact, I, you know, I can take the Sermon on the Mount and start you know, checking off how many Calvaries I don't participate with. Because the first thing they do is love your enemies, but you know, you can kill the ones that you don't like. Or you can, you know, murder the ones that, you know, are so, you know, unsavable, you know, just, you know, you know that you got to have, you know, a certain balance. You can't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And then I check off that Calvary and say, sorry, you know, you go your way and, you know, I'll watch you. But that's not what I learned. When I was there, I remember, you know, the Jesus movement as being Kumbaya moment and Kodak moment, not, you know, let's stand in front of Kent State and put flowers in the, the the barrels and pretend that that's only the hippies doing it. No, that was Jesus people doing it. We were taught peace, love, and joy because that was the hippie movement trying to identify what it believed in. I have a brother-in-law, or I have a nephew, I believe he is, um, Joshua Clem. He's posting a lot of humanism, a lot of false teaching, a lot of bad ideas, but they come straight out of the 60s. And I know where he's, where he's coming from. He, on the one hand, says he's a Christian, you know, and he believes in Jesus, but then he posts a lot of things that are, you know, kind of, eh, you know, it's sort of right, but it's really not knowing the difference between, you know, like a Mahatma Gandhi who wound, up, who wound up in hell and a Jesus Christ who's leading us into heaven. There's a difference. Mahatma Gandhi is a great man, but unfortunately he wound up in hell because he believed in peace he exercised belief, he believed in nonviolence, but he also did not believe in God. He chose a different path, and he chose the path of nonviolence. But he demonstrated to the world that that is a means, but not the only means. The same thing is true about the Tibetan monk, you know, the, the Dalai Lama. You know, he believes in, quote-unquote, peace, 
but not the peace that passes all understanding that Jesus gives that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of ways that seem right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And I saw within my own belief system, the Calvary Chapel movement, a lot of deviation going on. And today I see a certain amount of incorporation. You know, it wants to, as I see it, define itself by its, you know, some of its parts by trying to get everyone to cooperate in a family of churches. And, you know, that's nice, but sooner or later you have to tell someone no because they're going the wrong way. You know, and I'm not saying that Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa is, but it just, each one has its own venue that the pastor has to examine himself, the people have to examine themselves, the elders have to examine themselves, their selves, and each and every one of us stand alone before God that we should give an account for what we know we've examined. When I look at the scriptures, I know what Jesus taught. I know who Jesus is. I know how he speaks to me because he said he would. My sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. So, video church is never going, probably, I can't say never, but as far as the Lord has told me, video church is not a Calvary Chapel. It is what God has made it to be, an assembly of people that have come together freely to receive what God has to say and to share what God is doing. That's it. You can't give to Vidivo Church, and Vidivo Church can only bless you with what it's got, and that's what it does. It's only meant to be an outpouring, not an in-gathering of monies or religion or faith or people or whatever. No, you know, if you want to go somewhere else, please, for God's sake and for yours, go somewhere else or do something else. Same thing with the Calvary Chapel. Chuck used to say it. Hey, it's the Lord's church. If the Lord's leading you somewhere else, go somewhere else. Go do what the Lord's telling you to do. Admittedly, you know, you might want to make sure the Lord is telling you because sometimes living under the tutelage of a false pastor or a pastor who's maybe got some false teaching in him might be good discipline for you to learn how to deal with, you know, people that are in error. I know for myself, there's a pastor that he's back in ministry again. He's retired, I think, three times, and you know he keeps going back into ministry. And now he's returned to his first love, Klamath Christian Fellowship. I remember being there when he opened the doors. Hey, I remember that. You know, I remember the early days, and I remember what he was like. Now, the days of former self are greater than his latter because in his former self he was still malleable and teachable. His latter, he's pretty much set in his ways. He's chosen a different direction that he chooses to go. And he's not a Calvary Chapel. And I believe he can't be. Whatever reason, that's between him and the Lord and the Calvary Chapels. But, you know, God bless him because people love him. You know, he's a great worship leader and a great minister of God. I personally know that a lot of people grow and some get saved, you know, from his ministry. And so, in that capacity, that's what God uses them for. But it brings me to the point of looking up and looking at the Word of God and going, but why, Lord, are people going away from this Jesus that obviously is different than any other man? Why are they choosing to teach that Jesus didn't mean what he said and said what he meant? Why are they going in a different direction? And the fact is, it's the false Messiah. It's the false Christ. It's not going to be some, you know, Muslim that comes along and looks like the false Christ. No, it's going to be very easily perceived in the church of this false idea of Jesus, that somehow he's a gun-toting, you know, conservative Republican man that, you know, is for America and is going to, you know, convert the world. I don't think so. You know, sorry, but if I had to choose between what a lot of evangelicals are telling me Jesus is like and the President of the United States of America currently, I'd take the President of the United States currently. Because, you know, either hot or cold, I could deal with the cold, but I can't deal with the lukewarm kind of quasi-Christian that Jesus is being portrayed as. My good news does have bad news. The bad news is hell is real, and it is open door season for a lot of people going there no matter what their grace, once saved, always saved ideas are. Now, 
we don't stay on bad news though, and we don't stay focused on listening to only the positive and encouraging Kayla blasting in our ears and never hearing a negative word or a bad idea or a wrong example, even though we can always call them for prayer, you know, God bless you, you know, and keep going with that ministry. But the point being is that there has to be a balance. And so even in today's video vote today, we see as we continue in the word, you have need of patience. You see, the first part started off in um, Isaiah 38, 14, Psalm 6, 2 through 4, and Psalm 55, 4 through 6. But now we're at Hebrews 10, 36. And so when we say you have need of patience, what we read earlier was, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Boy. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return. Come back. Come soon. Come quickly. Deliver my soul. Oh, save me for your mercy's sake. Not because I deserve it, but because you are merciful and you're loving. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and the horror hath overwhelmed me. All of those things are happening to a Christian. All of those things can happen to you. Even though you have peace, love, joy, these things are part of real Christianity. They are part of both sides of the spiritual life of being led by the Spirit of God. And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. When we were recording earlier, we heard the turtle doves. And that's what I love about this time of year, and even later in the summer when it gets noisy. But you can hear the turtle doves in the morning. But then he says in Hebrews 10, 36, you have need of patience. And while they looked steadfastly towards the heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, you Christians, you born-again evangelicals, you religious people, you who know that Jesus is coming soon, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? Get busy. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall also come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We used to have a song by the Imperial says, I keep my eyes on the cloud looking for my Jesus, I keep my eyes on the cloud looking for that day, or it was written by someone else and they sang it, but there's a lot of songs about looking in the clouds and seeing. You know, I honestly believe that the rapture will be less than what people want it to be more. Of. In other words, I started writing a book last night, as a matter of fact, called The Next Day. Or no, The Next Day? The Next Day series. And it's called The Day After. And basically it talks about the reaction of people that live through the rapture and how few will be taken, not how many. How the reality of writing this book is also my way of showing how this pastor, and then you know some of the other books will be from different people's point of view, but this pastor named David, how he is looking at, you know, did it happen? Because it was so few that there really was no rapture disaster with planes falling from the sky. There was no children disappearing, which is not anywhere in scripture. I mean, I, if anything, when Jesus was born, they slaughtered the innocents. I mean, there's going to be a big slaughter after the rapture, and there, dare I say, it's not going to be, you know, simply, well, I think I'll die for the Lord because, you know, I'm a Christian, when your child is being slaughtered before your eyes. In other words, if God would take Isaac as a living sacrifice and ask Abraham, do you love me? If so, then go, offer your son in the place that I'll show you. And Abraham demonstrated to God that he did. And what that means to me is that it's not, you know, like Christians like to commentate, make commentary on certain portions of scripture without reading it. They, you know, they, they, they take this whole thing out of context of Abraham going, well, Abraham knew that he was going to get his son back. No, he didn't. He was going to kill the kid. That's the way it works. You know, the, the akeda or akida is that the, the idea of that sacrifice or the sacrifice of Isaac was that, hey, Abraham was willing to do it in order to prove that God was above all. 
and probably in his mind felt like he was justified because, frankly, he had loved Ishmael more than he loved Isaac, you know, and he was more, you know, attuned to, you know, failing than he was in succeeding, and that he had done a lot of things in his life that had failed miserably. And so the one thing that he does succeed is that he's willing to kill, and then stops as the angel stops him. So don't tell me that he knew he was going to get his son back. He'd get another son if he could have had a child at 90. He probably figured, hey, man, I'll get going, you know, maybe another 100 years and I'll have another son, you know, so I'll go 200 years old. So don't tell me you have the right interpretation when you're interpreting scripture or commentating on it. You may have an idea, but that's your own personal idea. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear. It just says, and there are a lot of different ways to look at it. And be sure to include all those other ways. Otherwise, you're just isolating yourself into boxed mentality and God will go beyond your boxed God. God is not a jack-in-a-box. He doesn't work according to your drive-through, you know, kind of ordering him to do what you want, you know, and then take off and go with him. That's what inductive Bible study does a lot nowadays. They take what they want and go with it. But yielding ourselves to what the Bible says and what God is speaking to us today in video today, that means we should be patient. You know, give God the opportunity to let you go through, you know, like I did, three days of misery, you know, and things not going right. And then finally deciding, you know, yeah, we need to change things and return to our first love. Return to what we love to do. This. Vidigo light. Vidigo. Vidigo tozer. Vidigo meditations. Vidigo prophecy. Vidigo, vidigo, you know. The vidigo church. The things that are vidigo, not devotional, you know. Vid Vidivo was started as a video devotional, and every time I get away from it, I see a, you know, oppression come down upon me in some way, eventually causing me to leave it alone and walk away. Even though, you know, boy, you know, we'll bring school the Bible back, but you know, I had to look around at the schools locally and say, you know, they're teaching some real false teaching. They even went so far as to get some kind of prosperity doctrine money maker, you know, come into the church and. You know, I think his name's Ramsey, you know. And, oh, let's go be, you know, a millionaire for Christ's sake, you know. And he's got a mansion, you know, and he's got this jets and everything, you know. And, you know, you only have to pay 60 bucks to take his class. Dare I say, you know, he can pay, you know, you can pay 60 bucks if you want to, but you could get, you know, something better than that for not paying. That's kind of why God raised up Video Church, because... As long as we have a ministry and we're doing what we do, everything's free. We, we give. We don't get. You know I mean, that's the beauty of what has exploded over the Internet and has taken off around the world. Is that, you know, Video Church not only is growing, but has, I hate to use the word exponentially, but has so overwhelmed, you know, what we're doing that I'm blown away. It reminds me of the early days of the Jesus movement when it's just like, hey, if it's free, that's me, you know, but if it's, you know, if you think you can give something, you know, that you have to pay tithing or, you know, to get something, that's false. Tithing in the original course of what was going on in the temple days was that not only did they bring an offering and a sacrifice, but the reason why there was meat in the storehouse was because there was famine in the land. If you recognize what kind of environment you're talking about, people had a central location where they met and assembled together. In Europe, they would have called it the castle. You know, there's a lot of dark ages where everybody, the villagers, you know, would run to the castle for protection. The villagers would run to the castle where there was stored meat. There was stored the army. There was stored, you know, sustenance for the sake of disasters. Well, that's what tithing was meant to be. You know, bring all the tithings into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house. You know, it wasn't about money. That came later when people decided to use and abuse a system of religion in order to cultivate people's feelings of doing something. And the money was supposed to be used to buy meat to replace, you know, whatever was not in the storehouse so that there would be a social program that was part of the religious observance of Judaism. And every Jew knows that, hey, you know, if your neighbor's hungry, you got to feed them. And Jesus had to remind them of that. Jesus came and said, look, if you're, how many of you know that at the, you know, if your neighbor comes over and knocks in the middle of the night and asks for a loaf of bread, will you get up and, you know, give him your loaf? Of course. Now, Jews would, you know, here in our culture, you'd probably shoot the guy through the door. You know, I mean, 
that's the way latest American mentality is, you know. You hear a knock in the middle of the night, you know, and if it doesn't say, you know, police officers, then you're probably, you know, pulling a gun on them or something, you know, stupid. But the reality of what Jesus was teaching was simply that you are supposed to care for and be there for your neighbor or your extended neighbor or anyone that asks. Because God has so blessed you, then you give. And you don't have to make it a big religious deal. You know, you don't have to keep saying, hey, since I'm a Christian, I'll give you a loaf of bread. <laughs> By the way, go to my gospel mission and I'll give you the gospel too. Hey, I got news for you. That's not what God intended. God intended that you should be able to know that, you know, when you're hungry, you can go, you know, to the church and get food. You know, you don't have to get a program, you know, and sign up and do all these things, supposedly. But that's the way it was supposed to be. Now, I'll admit that the, the deviation through the years has changed it and rearranged it and made it into something it shouldn't be. But the bottom line is that we don't. You know, at Video Church, hey, you know, my family knows more than most people that know me now that if they asked, I gave it to them. You know, including the shirt off my back. You know, I mean, there were things that I gave away that even to this day people look at and go, man, I wouldn't have given up, you know, house or home or all these other things in order to follow Jesus. And I said, yeah, I know, but I did because I was supposed to. Maybe you can't. Maybe you won't. Maybe you pay the United Way or you pay some other organization to take care of those things for you. But the bottom line is whatever it is the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. And that's why we customize our faith to how we deal with God one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, people get frustrated with me when I say, you know, I mean, Christians do, born again Christians, because I'll say, hey, you know, if you want to go to the Mormon church, go to Mormon church, I don't care, you know? Just have a personal relationship with Jesus and then do what he tells you to do. If he tells you, go there, go there. If you want to go to Judaism, hey, go check it out. I don't care, you know, or go down the street to some, you know, Pentecostal Holy Roller Church or go to Joel Osteen, you know, and feel good. <laughs> I mean, hey, people want to feel good. I mean, you know, that's why they go there. They feel good. But the bottom line is all of these things that are what we call the building blocks on top of the foundation, your bottom line is your foundation stone is Jesus. Your foundation is having a personal relationship with Him. Your personal religion is what you choose to add to your faith. Your faith, bottom line, has to have a one-on-one -on -one with God. If you don't have a one-on-one -on -one with God, you're wasting your time. Because no one's going to stand there in heaven with you. And all of us, at some point in time, are going to stand before Jesus and answer what we did with our lives. Jesus said it interestingly enough. He simply said that, hey, you know, you've got lots of religions out there, and that's fine. You know, I'm not going to argue with you about your religion. If you're following the scribes, follow the scribes. Watch what they say and do what they tell you to, but watch what they do. If you're following the Pharisees, follow the Pharisees. If watch what they say and watch what they do. But, you know, what I'm telling you is the bottom line is this is eternal life, that you know me and know him who sent me. Well, that brings us back to the greatest, you know, memory verse that most people memorize first. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you know the rest. So I don't have to say it. But that's the point. you got to deal with the bottom line before you can deal with any other line. Because everybody's going to give you a line nowadays. Hook, line, and sinker. And hey, I'm not stopping you from getting involved in all the other junk that I've seen most people pack in their trunk. You know, I mean, Calvary Chapels included, or vineyards, or evangelicals, or Catholics, or Protestants, or Mormons, or Jehovah's Witnesses, or Buddhists, or humanists, or Zionists, or my God, you know, talk about isms, there's everything under the sun that you could get involved in. But the one thing you can't deny ever when it comes to the foundational fact is that if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you can't deny that you talk to him and he talks to you. That's the difference. You see, it's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of what your faith is. And if your faith is in a personal relationship with God, then it's up to you and God to come to that intercourse, that interrelationship, that oneness where you hear him and he hears you and you are talking one to another. Then you can go your way and do what God tells you to do. And believe me, looking around, a lot of people are doing 
basically what they want to do as opposed to what God is telling them to do. 